Ich hoffe, ihr seid mir nicht böse, wenn ich meinen Vortrag nicht auf Deutsch gebe. De Obwohl mein Name eigentlich Deutsch klingt, ist meine erste Sprache eigentlich Spanisch. Also von dem her, Englisch ist mir ein bisschen einfacher. So, good morning everybody. What I would like to do today is tell you a little bit about the arms race and tell you a lot about the work that I've done in the recent years that has one thing in common, and the physicists will know what I mean, h-bar is zero. In other words, I do classical optimization. And for some reason, it became very important to understand classical optimization to be able to understand quantum optimization. So what I'd like to do is, I would like to start very easy just by telling you a little bit about optimization problems in general and optimization methods, in particular, why do we need new technologies? And then hopefully I'll be able to convince you that there is a deep synergy between classical optimization, statistical physics, high performance computing, and quantum computing. And those things really go hand in hand. And so what we've been doing is we've been using statistical physics methods to evaluate benchmarks, to evaluate hardware, but we've also been developing state-of-the-art optimization codes, for example, SAT solvers, Uh, we just submitted something to the SAT competition that is about a thousand times faster than last year's winner, so we're very excited about that. But we're also looking for the killer application for quantum annealers, and this is really important. So far, people have just played with a machine. The question is, can it be useful for something real, like something in technology? And so the big questions to be answered are, is a quantum annealer faster than current technologies? And does it do something that a classical machine can't do? And this is work that I've done with Firas Hamza at D-Wave. He's actually a machine learning person. He's the person that got me access to the D-Wave through the back door. Salvatore Mandran, Alejandro at NASA, and uh, Stefan Schnabel in Leipzig, and of course, the bunch of misfits, misfits that work at Texas. You see, we typically wear much shorter pants than these here, so good. Let me start with optimization. I don't think I need to convince you that nature is likely the best optimizer out there. For example, there's a reason soap bubbles are spherical. It's the minimal surface. If you find a square bubble, please let me know, okay? Lightning usually chooses the path of least resistance, and even though when you look at meandering rivers in the Amazon, they seem to be randomly going through a landscape, they're also looking for a path of least resistance. Now, we can learn from nature For example, if you want to design the new roof of the new stadium in Munich, you can put it on a supercomputer, or you can take a wire, bend it in the shape you want the stadium to look, you dip it into soap, and you solve the problem with one simple dip. Okay? So a soap bubble will always give you a minimal surface. You can, for example, also solve a maze with an ignited plasma. You take a maze, you fill it with gas, You put an electrode here, one here, you light the thing, and nature will instantly solve the maze for you. Just take a picture. And then, of course, I don't think I need to tell most of you that there's some relation also to optimizing current flow. Now, why are optimization problems important? Well, they play a key role across disciplines, engineering, industry, science, you name it. If you want to send a space probe out, you have to solve very complex optimization problems. Now, a lot of you might be thinking we're talking about flight plans and scheduling and things like that, but the hardest ones to solve are actually verification and validation. If you want to make sure that the probe works, so if part A breaks and part B doesn't break, but part C kind of breaks, does it still fly? You see, you have all these if statements. You become a really nasty problem. And if you, for example, if Lockheed Martin builds a new fighter jet, they spend about 40% to 45% of the cost just in verification and validation. So being able to do this faster is very, very important. Well, scheduling, I don't I think I need to convince you this is a very complicated problem. The more people you have, the harder it is to throw a party. And then finally, something that is very interesting to me, optimization has been used a lot in material discovery, where people are actually just running optimization algorithms on chemical components and discovering new materials before they have been synthesized. Now here I will talk about a subclass of op optimization problems, and these are the so-called binary problems. You have n variables, they are 0 or 1, plus or minus 1, whatever you want, and then you have a cost function h, and the physicists will know this h stands for Hamiltonian, and this cost function returns a number that characterizes optimality. In other words, the smaller the number, the better you have solved the problem. 
And the goal of any emphasis here on good optimization method is return the minimum of this cost function, ideally exactly, but that's very hard, but definitely efficiently. You want to know quickly. You don't want to wait the age of the universe. Let me show you one of the simplest problems that turns out to be one of the most difficult, and that is the traveling salesman problem. Suppose you have 72 cities or, say, 72 products in a supermarket, and you go shopping. This is typically how students in Texas go shopping. They just run from shelf to shelf, and you have to elbow them out of the way. Now, this is a very simple problem to pose, but it's a very hard problem to solve. And if you look at it, given our locations of n cities, and the goal is to find the shortest path, and your cost function is very simple, it's just the sum of the line segments connecting the cities. And you can run an optimizer like simulated annealing on this, and then you find your shortest route, okay? This seems to be a very easy problem, but the solution space is n minus one factorial. So with 100 cities, you're already looking at 100 factorial different routes. If you have a million cities, like say UPS, there's no way you will ever be able to solve that exactly. Best case algorithms scale exponentially in the input, and this problem is classified as NP hard. Now what does this mean? Well, there's many other optimization problems that are very interesting. You have the so-called constraint satisfaction problems. This is similar to this verification and validation. You have a Boolean formula, x11 or x12, and, and so on and so forth. And then the question is, can you find an assignment for these variables x so that this whole thing, which can be very long, evaluates to true? And this is a very hard problem to solve. You have number partitioning. Suppose you have a set of suitcases and you want to travel aboard abroad and you want to share the load with your friend, but you see this one might have a pillow, this one here probably has some electronics, the other one has lead blocks, etc. The point is you want to share the load evenly. And the more suitcases you have, the harder the problem is to solve. Now of course we're not interested in suitcases, but think about shipping goods, think about load balancing on a computer. Basically this is just a number partitioning problem. Okay. You have minimum vertex covers. Those of you who like to go to museums, have you ever seen that they like to stand at the edge between two rooms? It's very simple. You can look left, you can look right, and you're covering two rooms with one guard. And the question is, what is the minimum number of guards you can have to cover all rooms in a museum? It turns out, again, it's a very, very hard problem. And then there's other things like fault, fault diagnosis in circuits. As a matter of fact, my students sent this to me this morning. A group of French researchers proved rigorously that Nintendo games are NP-hard problems, okay, like Donkey Kong and whatnot else. So what do all these things have in common? You see, these are very broad classes of problems, and many other sub-problems that you might have to deal with on an everyday basis might map directly onto this. Well, they have a very rough energy landscape or cost function. What do I mean by this? If you take a traveling salesman problem and you move one city by a little bit, you could have a rearrangement of your tour that is order n cities. In other words, you can find a completely different solution. So small perturbations can drastically change the value of your cost function, which makes optimization very difficult. The other thing is that these fall in the so-called NP, or non-deterministic polynomial class. This is the class that contains all kind of decision problems. And basically what this means is you don't say, can I solve it, you just say, Sorry, you don't, you don't see what is the solution, you just say, can I solve it? And then there's an answer, yes or no. Now, NP means that you can verify the solution in polynomial time, but it says nothing about finding the solution, which typically is much harder than a polynomial. It's exponential in the input or worse, okay? So you see, many problems, even though they're this subclass of binary, fall into this very hard class, and they all can be somehow mapped onto what is called a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization or cubo problem. And a cubo looks nothing else like this. You have these QIJs, which basically relate the Boolean variables to each other. And you have the Boolean variables, plus minus one or zero one, whichever you want. Now you see, if you can build a machine specific to solve this type of problem, you could in principle tackle all of these very, very efficiently. And this is the goal of building new quantum annealing technologies, okay? So you have a very simple representation for many, many problems. So how do we solve these today? Well, there's two types of algorithms that we use on classical computers. We have the exact methods, 
they get you the solution guaranteed, but they're not practical. They only work for very small problems, mostly because it's usually some kind of exhaustive search where you just cut off pieces of face space that you know the solution might not be in. And then you have heuristic methods, which are very fast, but you don't know if you found the optimum. And that's a bit of a problem because you want to make sure sometimes that you have the optimal solution. Now, because exact methods tend to be so inefficient, the most common approach is heuristic. And the problem you have is that to make sure that you found the same solution, you will run your algorithm many, many times over and over with different initial conditions to see if you find always the same optimum, or at least a substantial amount of time. And then you can be kind of certain that you found the solution. And the big question is, instead of doing this in a big machine room, can we replace it by some quantum device that is non-deterministic like my cat? So why do we want to do this? Well, we all know about Moore's Law. And Nature earlier this year had a nice editorial called Beyond Moore's Law because we're kind of reaching a plateau when it comes to classical computing. What does Moore Law say? Gordon Moore predicted in the 60s that roughly every two years the transistor count would double. And this is great. You see here are the years, here's a log scale, and these dots are different transistors, and you see you can very nicely draw a line through it, and here you start with the Intel 4004 processor, Westmere, AMD K8, it all beautifully falls on a line. So you can just say, well, fine, I'll wait 10 years, and then I can solve a problem about 30 times uh, you know, larger. The problem, though, is what most people don't look at is the clock speed. And if you add the clock speed to the picture, you see that up until 2000, when I did my PhD, and you could boast that you have the 500 megahertz processor versus your friend only has the 266 one, it stopped at around 3 gigahertz, roughly, between 2 and 3. And the reason is that we're reaching um, fabrication limits. There's only so much smaller you can build these devices. There is noise and error correction at some point is just unfeasible. So in some ways, we have hit the wall. Now there's another thing that a lot of people don't talk about, and that is that a petaflop computer is something that you see all over the world. People are trying to build exaflop machines, 10 to the 18 operations per second. But what people don't think about is that you need gigawatt power to run such a machine. So it's like lights from Munich running a simulation. You know, that's about the choice you have to make. And so large companies like Google, IBM, Microsoft have been very heavily investing in new technologies already for many years, mostly in the quantum realm. And so the question is, is this a technology of the future? Now, I think Microsoft has a bit of a pioneering um, role in this. They have been doing a lot of research in this field, most in the topological quantum computing field. And so, you know, in some ways, what we would like is to be able to open a computer and then just start Windows Q. But we all know what happens with Windows. It just doesn't quite do what you want, which is why I use these nice silver shiny boxes with a fruit on it. Now, where are we now, joking aside? Well, as I said, we need a po definitely a paradigm change in computing. So we want to use quantum mechanics to build these non-deterministic machines. We want to use quantum parallelism and tunneling you know, to overcome barriers. And of course, algorithms that have been proven would run much faster on a quantum than a classical version. Think of Shor's factoring. What is the current state of the art in quantum devices? It's either small scale test beds or special purpose machines. Now, you can buy quantum devices. There's a company in Switzerland called ID Quantique. They will produce you a quantum random number generator. This is what it looks like. I have one in my office. It's pretty darn useless because it runs at 4 megahertz. So, you know, simulations don't do well. But it's a very beautiful device. You have a photon source, a semi-transparent mirror. The photon either tunnels or gets reflected, and that gives you your random bits, zeros, and ones. They also produce quantum encryption machines, and there's others devices that exploit quantum mechanics. As I said, the current state of the art are little test beds as well as special purpose machines. Now, I didn't bring you a quantum computer, but I can tell you right now where you can go and use one right away. 
There is a website by IBM, just Google IBM Quantum Experience. You can create an account, you get enough credits to run a few simulations, and they have a five qubit quantum computer with a web API that you can use and program yourself just by drag and drop of circuits. Beautiful little toy, you can use it. You can implement all kinds of gates like a controlled knot and rotations, which means the thing is universal. So you can in principle, in principle, build a device that can do as complex things as this laptop, in principle. Okay, but five qubits is just not enough. So I'll show you an example that I played with right before I came here. I implemented a controlled NOT gate. What is it? It's a two qubit quantum register. Basically, you have a control qubit. If it's set to one, it will behave like an exclusive OR. And if the control qubit is set to zero, it behaves just like the identity. So if you were to write it as a matrix, it's a four by four matrix, two ones in the diagonal, and then two ones in the off diagonal, okay? Identity, exclusive OR. So when you log in, you have identity, X, Y, Z rotations, Hadamard, Toffoli gates, whatever you want. And you just drag and drop them onto these lines, which are the five qubits. You connect them together and you put two readouts on it. And then you can just press run and you're running an actual quantum computer, okay? And what I strongly encourage you to do, because I forgot to add that plus here, is that you first simulate it to know if you did something wrong in your logic while programming it. But ideally, for this type of setup, if I set my target qubit to zero, Q1, and my control qubit, you see I put an X gate here so I convert the zero to a one, then I should expect an output only for one one, and all the others should be zero after the quantum computation. This is theory. In reality, after doing 1,024 shots, you see that 1, 1 appears about 91% of the time, and there's a few percentages down here. Now, you might say, well, this is awesome, right? We just used a quantum computer. But if you think about it, I only used of the order of six or so gates, and I already have an error of about 10% here. So if I were to use 10 gates, it gets worse and worse and worse. And clearly, there is just still not enough coherence in this small device. So it's cute, but not scalable. And so maybe we should go back a step, think about the 1930s and 40s where we built special purpose computers to solve problems and see if we can do the same thing with quantum devices. Now, what is a special purpose computer? It's a semi-programmable computer designed to perform a limited set of tasks, okay? It's not something you can play a game on. It's something you can only do one thing. Think of a coprocessor in some ways. It's actually something very old. There is Antiquitera 100 BC. It was found on the bottom of a ship in the bottom of the Mediterranean, and it was a mechanical device to predict the position of celestial objects. And this thing just was built. You turn the crank, and then basically tells you, oh, star's going to be up there tonight. Now, in the 1940s, Fermi built this thing called the Fermiac, which was a phenomenal device. It used pencils and random numbers to, to basically do neutron transport. Okay, so it was basically a mechanical computer, just drawing lines on paper. It was fantastic. And more recently, a Italian-Spanish collaboration built an FPGA-based machine called Janus that is specially built to solve Cubos. And it's a phenomenal fast machine, but again, all it can do is solve a very particular problem. So the advantage of all these things is speed. You see, you don't have to sit down and calculate where the stars will be. You just turn a crank and you have the answer. But the disadvantage is you can only do a very limited set of applications and they're expensive. You're building a device just to solve one problem, okay? So do we have quantum special purpose machines? And I think most of you must have heard of these things. The answer is yes. It's the D-Wave, latest iteration being the 2X. It's a big black box, literally and figuratively. What is it? It's a special purpose machine. It costs about $15 million. People typically lease it because then you get free chip upgrades. It's radical new chip technology and you have 1,000 superconducting flux qubits. IBM 5, this thing, 1,000. With 1,000, you can start doing interesting things. Several different companies slash governments have purchased these. And why is this so important? Because in principle, it can minimize any problem described by a cubo. You see, so all these problems that I mentioned earlier can in principle be solved on this type of machine. 
Now, what is actually inside the huge black box? You have the Washington quantum chip. This is what this looks like. It's beautiful, actually. You have these three tiers of wires coming out. Very nice to look at. You put that thing on a cryo mount. The cryo mount goes at the bottom of a cryostat. You want to cool this down to millikelvin or, or um, to make sure that, you know, A, it's superconducting, and B, you don't have noise. And then you want to put it in a big black box that is shiny because you want to sell a product, but it's basically a Faraday cage to prevent there to be any noise. And then you have three racks, which are just pretty hidings for the pumps. Now, you can go inside the black box when you visit D-Wave, and you can see roughly how big this thing is. In here, this goes into the vessel with the cryostat, and down here is where the chip is mounted. Now, I said that this thing has 1,000 superconducting flux qubits, or quantum bits. What are these? Well, please focus on the MRI machine. Some of us have been in there more than once late, lately. So I think everybody has seen an MRI machine. Basically, you have a magnetic field that produces, sorry, you have a current that produces a magnetic field, and therefore you have a flux going through this loop. Now, the way the qubits are implemented on D-Wave is basically the exact same thing, except on a much smaller case. You have tiny little either niobium or aluminum oxide rings. There you can have clockwise or counterclockwise currents, and you see these induce fluxes either up or down, and therefore you can produce any superposition of states in these little loops by having these currents flowing around. It's a highly non-trivial task to, of course, load these fluxes onto these individual loops, and the interaction between the individual qubits are nothing else than also superconducting fluxes, okay? So the whole thing, the interactions as well as the qubits are the same technology, basically. And like that, you can then wire things together and build a quantum optimization device. In this case, you're limited to four bits resolution, so a number that has more than four bits precision, you cannot encode in the device. And one of the biggest drawbacks is that you have a hardwired topology, like this is a cartoon that I just drew. In other words, you have to wire them together, so it's not that you can, say, solve a traveling salesman problem with a particular route, you need to somehow embed that problem onto the topology of the computer, and that's a huge issue, because embedding, for example, of a traveling salesman problem with N cities requires from you N to the four qubits. And if you have 1,000 qubits, you're solving a tour that you can solve with a pencil, okay? Still, this is a huge technological feat, so why the fuss? If any of you has ever come across D-Wave's website, it says the quantum computing era has begun. I wouldn't say that. It's the special purpose quantum annealing era that has begun. And, you know, when you have a website like this, then you make it to the cover of time. You have a lot of wild media coverage. They're all crazy claims of speeds higher than commercial codes. And, you know, at least me, if I see something like this, I just want to poke holes into it. So the big question is, can this thing do anything that current technologies cannot do? Now, I've told you the class of problem that you can solve with this machine. I've told you roughly how the machine works, what it is made out of, what the goal is of all this, but I still haven't told you how the machine optimizes. And for this, we need to go back 7,000 years. As a matter of fact, Germany was very important in these developments. Because in the Neolithic era, people discovered that if you cool a piece of metal slowly, you anneal it, it becomes better, and you can more efficiently bash each other's heads in, okay? Yeah, that's what we all want, you know. So you can take the same idea and simulate it in a computer, and this is called simulated annealing. The idea is very simple. You have your Hamiltonian or your cost function. You sample it, say, with some kind of stochastic algorithm like Monte Carlo, and then if the system is thermalized, you cool it, and then you do this according to some very nice slow schedule, and there's even a theorem that proves that you will find the optimum in infinite time. So the method technically works, but infinite time is just not short enough. Um, and then hopefully you'll find a solution to the problem. Now the problem is that this is a one-way type optimization. You see, you start at high temperature and you cool down in the hope to find an optimum. So if you have a landscape like this thing over here, it's very easy to get stuck in some metastable state. So it's a very inefficient optimizer. Now, how do you work around it is very simple. You run it in what is called repetition mode. Remember what I said earlier about heuristics? You just start with many different initial conditions, repeat the simulation tens of thousands of times until you hit the jackpot, okay? 
This is the classical version, and this is what we call a sequential algorithm, because you start at one point, and you sequentially reduce a control parameter. Now, the quantum annealer does exactly the same, except that it uses quantum fluctuations. So what you do now is, you start with your problem, you add quantum fluctuations, so now you don't have a dot anymore, you have basically a wave function, and then basically, you have fluctuations that determine a tunneling radius, so you're not limited anymore to a local search, and if there is a barrier that is thin enough, potentially you can tunnel through the barrier and then find the optimum of the problem. You see, so if you have something with many barriers that are thin enough, you should have a quantum advantage in theory. And the way you do this, and this is for the experts in the audience, is you have your original cubo, you have a transverse field that does not commute with the original quantities, that produces quantum fluctuations, and those you reduce according to some protocol. Now, before I can tell you about the results, for example, that Google put out in the press last year, I need to go a step back and tell you a little bit more about the simplest, nastiest cubo out there. And the simplest, nastiest cubo out there that we need to study for quantum speedup is called a spin glass. Now, I know that there are some of you in the audience that are not physicists, right? Oh, okay, I see some heads moving, good. For a second I was worried here. So let me start with something simple that everybody knows, a magnet. Everybody has seen this thing, sticks to the fridge, works well, and so on, okay? So if we zoom into the magnet, you can assume there is some kind of lattice structure or chemical structure, whatever you want to call it, and at each of these vertices of your structure, you can have other magnetic grains, atoms, moments, you name it, just little magnetic entities, okay? And so if you think of these as tiny little magnets, you see if most of them point in the same direction, you will get a net magnetic moment, and this is where this thing sticks to the fridge, okay? It all adds up. Now, 90 years ago, actually this year, Ernst Ising solved this model during his PhD known as the Ising model. And this is the mathematical representation of the pictorial representation I showed you in the previous slide. Basically, this matrix you call QIJ, it just represents interactions between the different moments, and these little magnets are a Boolean variable. Either it's this way or that way. Very, very simple to do. And then you can put it all down mathematically. You have a sum over these QIJs as ISJs, the sum in this case is over nearest neighbors, and because you want a ferromagnetic order, in other words, all the Boolean variables being the same value, you set the Q to be all one for all spins. Note that there is an overall minus sign here. This is a very simple model. I like to call it the fruit fly of statistical physics because you can very richly study many, many things with small variations of this model. For example, in two space dimension, it has a thermodynamic phase transition at high temperatures. Nothing happens. But then at some point, you have a critical temperature, which in 2D is 2.269 something, where the magnetization, which is basically the average over these magnetic moments, suddenly becomes non-zero, and the system magnetizes with all spins up or all spins down. So a very simple model to describe a magnet. And now the important question is, what happens if we add disorder? This is where it gets ugly, like really ugly. So if you now take this simple model that I introduced before, this cubo, but now you take these QIJs to be random, you will see that you obtain a really horrible problem to solve. And it's very easy to pose, but incredibly hard to solve. Let me go over the ferromagnet again here, just so that we're all clear on what is going on. Remember, we have an overall minus sign. So if you want to minimize the energy of this four, by, uh, four, of this four spin plaquette, then you want to have the product of all pairs as ISJ to be positive. If ISJ is always positive with the overall minus sign and this is always plus one, you minimize the expression. So it's either all spins point this way or all spins point this way, okay? Now, we can add disorder and just change one of these bonds. You see, if we just look at these two right here and you have a minus, this minus here will cancel this minus so to make this dimer contribution the smallest, you do this by having the product being negative. In other words, one variable up, one variable down, or vice versa. And so if you now go around the plaquette, you see this guy and this guy, very happy, have a plus point in the same directions. These two don't like each other, they have a minus, everything's good. But now this guy in the lower left corner has a serious issue because it wants to agree with these two 
and they point in opposite directions. It's easy here in this case to see, to do the math, what the minimum of the energy would be, but if you have now a system with a thousand of these plaquettes and randomly speckled with minus signs, you're gonna find yourself solving an NP-hard optimization problem. And you see, it's very easy to pose. It's very rough in the energy landscape. You have many metastable sets, so it's computationally very hard. If the topology is non-planar, it's in the NP class, this is proven, and it's ideal for torturing algorithms and computing devices. If you find an algorithm that can solve this very efficiently, you implicitly have developed an algorithm that can solve all the other problems that I showed you before efficiently. So let me tell you a few of the early benchmarks of the D-Wave 2. Some of you might have heard about these things in the press in 2014, last year in 2015, etc. And the very early benchmarks had a lot of problems, problems that computer, uh, sorry, quantum physicists didn't really think of. This is where the statistical physics comes in. Basically, the first issue was the choice of the disorder and the algorithm. There were these beautiful results by Ronoff et al. It was a paper in science that was fantastic. They selected the QIJs to be plus minus one. This would be the easiest thing to do. They ran it a thousand times, did a thousand different coupling choices, determined what is called a time to solution, how long does it take me to find the solution to the problem, and they ran the D-Wave 2, at this time with 512 qubits, against highly optimized simulated annealing classical codes. Here in a log-log scale, you have a heat map of these different experiments, and if the D-Wave was exactly the same as fast as a, quantum, as, a, as a classical device, you would find a smudge along the diagonal. But you see that the smudge moves away. In other words, D-Wave is much, much slower for the vast variety of problems. Having said that, it is faster for a subset of them. So what they said is, okay, we did these experiments, we deem our results to be inconclusive. D-Wave 2 does better on some instances, but fails against highly optimized GPU codes for many, many of the problems, all these up here. Having said that, if you think about it, silicon technology and algorithms have been around for 50 plus years. This thing hasn't been around for even a decade. And it's already keeping up with <coughs> excuse me, very well-established technology. Now, one big issue, though, is that you're, you're comparing the fastest dirt bike against the fastest street bike, either on dirt or on the street, you see? So it's not a really fair comparison because it's two very different technologies. Now, the second very large problem was the choice of the disorder. As, uh, pardon me, the choice of the chip topology. D-Wave built this on what they call the camera graph, which you see right here. The idea was very simple. There's very little interference between the different qubits. There is an individual addressing of the qubits that is very easy in this topology, and it's scalable and has large automorphisms. But this thing has a big issue. The current chip has 1,152 qubits in theory, but you always have trapped fluxes, which means that you see these gray ones here, these are dead qubits. So if you have a problem that you want to solve, for example, a constraint satisfaction problem that you have to embed onto the D-Wave, you already have an overhead due to the embedding, but then you have an additional overhead because you have to work around these dead things here that break the symmetry of the lattice, okay? So <clears throat> this is a very large problem for two reasons. Number one, huge overhead, and number two, it's effectively a 2D spin glass. Now, why does this matter? It matters because a 2D spin glass has no finite temperature transition. So, basically, <coughs> excuse me, if you were to now study these random benchmarks like that in 2014 on this D-Wave device, a thermal algorithm has an unfair advantage. And the reason is that these dominant barriers actually only form when you're very close to t equals zero. So the quantum annealer is always at a low temperature. It has always these barriers. The thermal annealer comes down from no barriers and only finds them at the very end. So it's a bit of an unfair comparison. The other thing is that the choice of the disorder matters. They used by modal disorder. And typically speaking, you have about 10 to the seven solutions to the problem. So it's very, easy to accidentally find the right solution. <clears throat> and so it's a bit like you want to play golf, and your golf course has 10 to the 7 holes. And so it's very, very easy to hit a hole in one. 
So the solution that we proposed, and I'm gonna skip all this because the talk would be too long, and then Google took on is to engineer problems that work around the chip limitations and, <coughs> sorry, and that are engineered to detect any quantum advantage, okay? And this is basically what we're gonna do here, so we're gonna pluck all these holes in some way and make the problems more sensitive to quantum problems or quantum effects. Now, last year in December, there were a lot of press releases. Here is one from PC World. NASA, Google reveal quantum computing leap that leaves traditional PCs in the dust. And the claim is that the quantum machine is 100 million times faster than a classical computer. When I read this, <coughs> excuse me, I immediately thought, I gotta fix this. There's no way that this is going to be true. So let me show you the results of Google. Here you have simulation or so time to solution as a function of problem size. You have quantum Monte Carlo, which is a simulation of the quantum algorithm on <coughs> classical hardware. Here is simulated annealing, and here is a D-wave machine. And the offset is irrelevant. What matters is the slope here, because that's what scales in the thermodynamic limit. And you see very nicely that both quantum approaches have very flat slopes compared to simulated annealing. And so if you take now this number here, and you take this number here, then you get 10 to the 8, and you say, woohoo, we're way faster. So this, of course, is a pile of horseshit pardon if I put it that bluntly, because again, these offsets depend on the machine you're using. I can always reduce this number by using more cores. <clears throat> but what really matters is the slope. And what Google showed is that for specially tailored problems, quantum approaches scale better. Now, what are the problems that they studied? They call them the weak strong clusters. Remember those chimera lattices that I showed you earlier? What they did is they always take one K44 cell and connect it to another one. Everything is ferromagnetic here. And then these on this, what is called the, the strong partner, are connected to another of these clusters. Now, you see there is a strong negative field. <coughs> My throat is killing me today. And a slightly smaller positive field. And so when you cool down, you can very easily get fooled into going into the wrong valley. Because it's ferromagnetic, you know that everything will point in the negative direction because of this. But it's very easy to get lost and fooled by this other cell that is messing with the solution. And then this cluster here, this gray box, which I represent here as small boxes, are just randomly connected to each other with this random spin glass backbone. This is the problem they used, and it's designed to fool an algorithm like simulated annealing. Now, the problems, though, are that, as we know, simulated annealing is a poor optimizer, and Monte Carlo has a lot of trouble in external fields. So we decided, well, what about if you use a state-of-the-art sequential algorithm known as population annealing, and see if we can do as good or if not better? Now, in a nutshell, what is simulated annealing? It was this population annealing. Remember, in simulated annealing, this is what happens. In simulated annealing with repetition, you might find a solution. And in population annealing, it's a very efficient method <coughs> where at each temperature step, you perform a resampling across the, the Boltzmann distribution. And then you kill the unfit ones that get stuck, and you repopulate the ones that are fit. And so in principle, what you're doing is something like this, and therefore you have a much higher chance of finding the optimum. Now, I don't have much time to explain in detail how the method works. Some people call it particle swarm algorithms. But what I want to show you here is just this figure. I want you to focus on this. This is population annealing versus simulated annealing on 512 sites and 1,000 sites. And basically, the resampling step is a tiny little overhead. And I want you to just focus on these two orange lines. And you see that if your population size is about um, 100,000, you see that population annealing can solve 100% of the problems, but simulated annealing, doing 100,000 repetitions only finds about half. And if you have about 1,000 sites, population annealing still can solve all of them, but simulated annealing can solve a single one of them. 
So this is a much, much more powerful optimizer. Well, let me show you the results. Here you see the original data by Google, and this thick orange line is our new data. You see it scales better as simulated annealing, but still worse than the quantum approaches. So maybe this might be an evidence for some kind of quantum advantage. And I will show you this is not the case. The advantage is what we call sequential and limited. What does this mean? Well, we went to our toolbox and pulled out all possible algorithms we could find on our laundry list. And on the next on the slide, I'm just going to list those because it's really a long laundry list, OK? <coughs> we did some really nasty things. You see, we know that these weak, strong clusters are, in principle, a ferromagnetic entity. So we can just take those and convert them into individual spins. That means that 16 sites are converted to one site, and then you optimize a much, much smaller problem. OK? So these are algorithms where we abuse the shape of the problem. We know it ahead of time, so we can tailor the algorithm to be better. Then we have what we call non-tailored algorithms that are state-of-the-art solvers, where there is no assumptions made about the problem. You just put them on and solve, and then there are the results done by D-Wave. Let me show you these results now, the scaling, and please don't try to figure out what is what. It's a waste of your time. But what you can see right away is that in addition to the two thick lines, which are the quantum approaches, there are a lot of other thin lines that have roughly the same or better slopes. So what we did is we fit now to the largest system size. And the reason is that the D-Wave results have a kink. This is because of noise. And then we assume that there is a stretch exponential type scaling of the problems and determine this exponent b. The smaller b, the better your problem scales. Well, here are the b's for the different algorithms. And to make your life easy, I'm just going to color it in. Here are the sequential methods. This is simulated annealing, population annealing, D-Wave 2. We did two fits, one that has a correction term that's the blue, so just focus on the red. Then you have the tailored ones where we exploit the symmetry of the problem. You see they scale really well, so again, smaller means better. But then are the non-tailored state-of-the-art algorithms that we developed, and you see that they still are better than the D-Wave. So a claim of 10 to the 8 is not there the second you use a proper algorithm. And this is what we said. This is only sequential speed up. Now, does the scaling persist for large system sizes? And this is very technical. I'm just going to go through it very briefly. And for this, you need to understand how to measure order in spin glasses. You see, the system has no order. So the only way that you can see if something is ordered is if you compare two pictures of the system over time. If these are the same, the system is frozen in space. And if this keeps changing, then the system is still evolving at a high temperature. So this thing is called the overlap. So we simulate two copies of the system with the same disorder. And then we measure this quantity. And then we can measure the distribution of this overlap. Now, in a ferromagnet at high temperature, the distribution of the magnetization would be a Gaussian around zero. The system is not ordered. And at low temperature, either all spins up or all spins down, which means two delta functions. In a spin glass, however, you can have a multitude of peaks because you have these dominant valleys in the energy landscape. So this distribution, P of Q, and I don't want you to understand what this means. I just want you to see it as a pictorial representation, really mirrors the energy landscape. If you have one peak, and this is spin reversal symmetry, so it's symmetric, then basically you have a single valley. And if you have multiple peaks, you have multiple dominant valleys in the energy landscape. Okay? So something that has many peaks, like the black line, has big barriers, and something that has few peaks has thin barriers. And something that I want to say is that this also affects the efficiency of algorithms. So let's look at these Google instances. We found two classes. This is one, so either one dominant valley or a very thin barrier. Or we found this, where we have two separated peaks. And so what this means is that either we have a thin barrier with a Hamming distance less than 16, or we have a very thick barrier, which is too thick for the system to tunnel. And now you can look at the ratio of thin to thick systems. And what you find is that the fraction of instances with by barriers grows very quickly. And you can predict that if Google were to study the same thing with a chip double the size, they would see no more quantum speed up. The scaling would break down.
Okay, so not only did we show that classical algorithms are faster, we can also predict that the scaling advantage will vanish for large n. Now the very last thing I wanna show you is something really cool, and I ask you for one and a half minutes. And that is, can we use this P of Q, this distribution for something else? Remember we had the traveling salesman problem at the very beginning. What if we were to just stochastically sample it? In other words, take pairs of cities and randomly swap out these tours, and then just measure an overlap between tours. So if two cities share the same line, we count it towards the overlap, and if not, we don't count it to the overlap, okay? Again, you can define a function, this P of Q, and you see you have those that have one peak and those that have a lot of wiggles. And when we look now at solvers to study this traveling salesman problem, those that have one peak, we have a success probability of roughly 100%. That means there's one dominant tour that is easy to find. Those that have many peaks, what it means is you have many tours that are very similar but competing. So the system can get trapped in suboptimal spaces. And those are very hard to solve. And what we can do now is, just to better illustrate this, is integrate this up to a certain cutoff, just so that we can convert a curve to a dot, and now make a heat plot of the success probability of the algorithm as a function of the weight of the integral. And you can see very nicely that these are very nicely correlated. What this means is that we can stochastically sample a problem and predict now if it's gonna be typically easy or typically hard without having solved it. And that's the key important step here, okay? So we tried this out for many, many different problems. And here you have spin glasses, traveling salesmen, satisfiability problem, DWF2, a whole laundry list of algorithms, stimulate annealing, quantum annealing, parallel tempering, population annealing, extremal optimization, walks out, et cetera. And everywhere we tried it, it worked. Well, what does this mean? Well, we can go now and we can engineer problems, you know, just by randomly producing and then mining them, where quantum annealing excels and classical algorithms fail. But this is a bit of cheating, you see, because you are going in and picking out the cherries where it will work. What is more interesting, though, is we can use this function now to predict for which problems quantum annealing will excel. And not only that, we can predict the difficult difficulty of the problem without solving. Think about it. If UPS could figure out ahead of time if solving the tour scheduling problem was gonna be hard, they might as well just go with an easier solution than actually trying to really optimize it. And this is what this gives you an ability. Now I'm gonna show you results that are unpublished. They're only as of last week, and we're writing this up right now with Google. Because we can now look at this function, this P of Q, we can now easily predict if a problem will run well on a quantum annealer or not. And one example is a problem from the constraint satisfaction field called the weighted partial max 2 sub. Don't bother what it is, but if you measure P of Q, it looks like this. You see, you have a lot of spikes, which corresponds to very thin barriers in energy landscape. We selected these random problems, gave them to Google. They ran in on quantum Monte Carlo, and at first they thought they made a mistake. And the reason was, what you see here is the speed up of quantum annealing over simulated annealing, that the speed up for 90 plus percent of the problems was at least a factor of 1,000 of quantum, of quantum Monte Carlo. So we were able to predict ahead of time that weighted partial max sat is a problem where a quantum annealer will be better than any other type of simulated annealer. We've in the meantime extended this to vertex covers, three sat graph coloring, circuit fault diagnosis. In other words, and this is something really crazy, we have now finally unlocked quantum supremacy. That we can ahead of time predict for what class of problem a quantum computer will be efficient and for what class of problem you might as well go with classical. So where are we now? You see, in some ways we're really at the brink of something new. We have these new quantum machines. And so hopefully I've been able to convince you that insights from statistical physics are key in predicting speed up. We have unlocked now what we call quantum supremacy. We can predict ahead of time if a problem is well suited for a quantum annealer or not. 
And my prediction is that eventually we'll have quantum devices that will serve as coprocessors that will then work in a type of hybrid hardware to solve hard optimization problems. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.